Mr. Lars Crozier, um, welcome to welcome back to the Investor Show. Thanks for having me. Oh, awesome, yeah. awesome. So now we're some very troubling times. I know you're out there in the UK. Uh, I'm here in Denver, Colorado, as you can see in my beautiful background there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm here in Denver, Colorado, and I want to get your idea. Well, first of all, you know, tell everybody a little bit about yourself because I'm pretty sure I missed some stuff. Um, I'm, I'm, well, I'm Danish. I lived in the U.S. for 10 years. I went to undergrad and graduate school there, um, but I've lived in London the last 20 plus years. I, I had a hedge fund here for for a number of years, and um, um, and I still sit on the board of a number of funds, both here in the U.K., but also, also abroad, including the U.S., uh, so I'm still very much involved with the industry. Uh, I, I saw you had one book up. I'd written a couple of books about finance over the last mm -hmm. um, several years. Um, so I guess I'm involved uh, in that, uh, I should say, peripherally uh, as well. Um, then I'm a, I guess I'm a private investor, and, and I've also been involved with a charity uh, in the last four or five years here in the UK. Okay. All right. So you guys and girls heard it from him live. So we're in some very troubling times right now. And uh, in yeah. your latest book, this is one that you know that I uh, read a while ago. In your latest book, you uh, and you were talking about in your latest writing as well. In these troubling times that we're having right now, and you spoke about how mm. to invest and have a sleepless night. Can you explain to the people out there what do you mean by how can you invest and have a sleepless night when we're in turmoils like we are in right now? Uh, without a sleepless night, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, without a sleepless night. Um, look, I think I was just let me start by the premise of a lot of the, a lot of the work I've done, which is yeah, the very first the thing you got to ask yourself is who are you? Right? Who are you as an investor? There's a um, in a wide range of shows and advices and the press in general. This is incredible rush to. Um, somehow outperform the market, somehow beat the market, pick the right stock, pick the right time to buy stocks, pick gold, pick Bitcoin, what have you. Um, where I start is really uh, with the premise, that, let's just talk about stock markets, we can talk about other asset classes too. I start with the premise that it's actually unbelievably hard to outperform the stock markets. It's unbelievably difficult um, particularly considering the cost and expenses you incur as a private investor to um, to consistently over time do better than the wider uh, stock market or the wider financial markets. Um, but it's not only that. So what I mean by that, by the way, that means if you take the S&P 500 as an example, um, I'm saying you can't pick better than that index. And when we talk about how that's constructed, you can't pick better than that index any one stock, or even deselect any one of the 500 stocks. And um, just jumping to the conclusion, you are far, far better off, assuming that your risk tolerance is such that it makes sense, you're far, far better off investing in the broadest, cheapest equity index than you get your hands on. So not only are you um, statistically, but also in, well, in every, every way, really, highly, highly unlikely to be able to outperform the markets, but also um, you are highly unlikely to pick the, call it one to two out of 10 active asset managers that will outperform that index over a 10 year period. Um, and as a result, if your risk tolerance is such that you should invest in equities, and again, we're just talking equities here, you should buy the broadest, cheapest equity index you can get your hands on. And that is, in fact, um, the global equity index tracker. Um, and there are a number of providers that provide those. Vanguard is one. You know, there's an MSCI tracker. Um, and that's, I think, the premise of a lot of my work. So I'm not, I'm not debating whether markets can be beaten. I don't, I don't think you have to make that kind of a statement. I'm saying, can you, as an investor, outperform the markets? And if you can come to the conclusion that you cannot, it's my view that your financial life will be far better as a result. So this is actually completely aside to all the stuff that's going on in the world around us right now, which, is, which, which I'm happy to have perspectives on. But I think it's very, very, if you take nothing away from this, um, 
podcast, then then remember that. And at least do yourself the favor of questioning whether you can beat the markets, and you'll likely come with the conclusion that you cannot. Okay. So, guys and girls, to kind of sum up what Mr. Lars Crozier is saying, you could correct me if I'm wrong on this, but you're essentially saying that, hey, to all the new investors out there, to the people that are right now that are saying, hey, look, we're seeing this downturn in the economy, the coronavirus is going crazy, the bull market is out, um, hmm. I want to pick stocks. I see Google is on sale, Microsoft is on, all these companies that are down, and you are saying that, hey, by you picking stocks nine times out of 10 in the next 10 years, you are not going to be able to beat the index in most cases. Well, that yeah, that's not quite what I said. I said statistically mm -hmm. speaking, mm -hmm. let's divide it into two. One is you yourself picking stocks on some uh, online platform. So you go and you check out the news and research the companies and you pick, what do you say, Google and Apple and what have you. Um, that's, that's one way to go about it. The second is that you pay someone you know, fidelity or something like that to pick the stocks for you. And they will invariably have very snazzy looking ads and things saying they've beaten the market over the last five, 10 years, what have you. And we can talk about how, why they have those ads. But so take those two. The first case is very, very unlikely. If you could do that, good luck to you. Let me know how you, how you do it and go get rich. Um, but that's statistically highly unlikely. The second case is that the active fund managers after, because keep in mind, they also, on top of what they charge you, they have their own fees and expenses. Um, they in call it 15, 20% of the cases over a decade actually outperform the same index that you can buy from Vanguard for 0.1% a year or less. Um, and unless you can pick that, call it one and a half out of 10 active managers, ahead of time, then you shouldn't try. And what are the chances that you can do that? They all look shiny and fresh. And by the way, the ones that have done well in the past, that's no indicator that they're gonna do well in the future. So don't don't be fooled by that. Got it. So you're essentially, okay. So you're pretty much telling the new investor, the person that's coming in right now that wants to invest for the future. Um, the audience here, a lot of people are 20, 30 years old, and they're looking for opportunities to be able to um, invest, right? Mm -hmm. They're looking at, I want to take advantage of this bear market. And you're essentially mm -hmm. saying, hey, if you feel like you have an edge over the market, then go get rich, right? But you're saying yeah. the likelihood of, of you going out there, starting an E-Trade account or whatnot, and just picking some stocks that you think are doing well, you're going to become off, you're going to come out better just buying the index yeah, yeah, look, i'm not saying don't invest that's a very important message here i'm saying absolutely invest absolutely invest but how should you invest and the reason you should invest is because um you hope to gain attractive returns from in the future like if we you know let's discuss how the what's happening in the world right now but historically equity markets have gone up called four or five percent above inflation vastly vastly superior to virtually any other asset class and just you know, what does that mean in practical terms? That means that uh, that your money, if you had $100 um, on average over, you know, if, if markets do in the past, in the future like they have in the past, which they almost certainly won't, then that $100 would become $200 in about 15 years um, and uh, without you doing anything. Now, that's much, much better than having sit in a bank account where you might even get negative interest these days and the money would be eroded by inflation. Um, so absolutely you should invest. Now, should you, what, how much should you invest in equities? Well, that kind of depends on who you are and your personal circumstances. Now, clearly what's happened with this, with this, with this horrible virus is not only the markets have declined dramatically and individual stocks even more so, um, but also the risk of the market has gone up a lot. Now, I don't know if your listeners are familiar, but there's something called the VIX index which essentially is there's a market for the future risk of the market. I know that sounds like double talk, but just accept that for a second, that there is, there's a traded market for how risky essentially the world, but, but, but the stock markets are gonna be in the future. And before this crash, those volatility indices uh, were at or near the lowest they had ever been. So essentially the world was saying that the world, the, the future is not risky. Now in a world that's 
not risky. Don't expect, expect to be paid a lot. Now, after this virus happened, the risk, implied risk of the market has gone up four, four or five times, I don't even know, but something that order of magnitude, which is essentially the market saying, look, the future is really, really risky, right? So are you bottom picking? Well, maybe, I don't know, but people that invested 10% higher than that probably also thought that. Right? So all I'm saying is it's really, really risky. Now, commensurate with that, is it reasonable to expect a higher return? Well, yeah, absolutely, right? Historically, risk and return have, have gone hand in hand. And so it's, it's not unreasonable that in, you know, you, you're taking more risk so you get higher returns. But just be sure that you can afford to take that risk, right? So uh, perhaps a terrible example, but let's say you need open heart surgery next year and it costs $100 and you have $105. Well, don't put that $105 in the equity markets. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. Put it under your pillow or in government bonds or somewhere where it won't erode, possibly almost certainly won't erode in value. But if you have a longer time horizon, and you can afford to lose money, at least in the near term, then, yeah, you know, absolutely, you should invest. Okay. Now, it's two things you just spoke about. For people out there, uh, I understand he's saying that, hey, look, go ahead. No, I was mm -hmm. just going to say about the virus. It's, yeah, yeah it's, 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 the virus is an interesting, I mean, it's a horrible thing, but it's also an interesting thing in the sense that, this is a global crisis. Right? It's, it's, it's everywhere. You know, in, in fact, uh, I was just on the phone with my sister who lives in New York, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting how, you know, it's, it's, the financial crisis was different because countries were geared differently. This, this thing, we're all having to do similar things eventually to protect our old and protect our societies. So for the first time, I think a global diversification is not as powerful as it has been in the past. So the reason you diversify is, you know, you can buy equities in Australia and Japan and the U.S. And if you buy a global uh, index tracker, that's essentially what you're doing. Now, the diversifying benefits is that, of course, if you're American, well, you shouldn't actually necessarily invest as much in America because you're already planted exposed to the American economy through your house, through your job, through your other investments. So you should diversify away from that. And that's a powerful message that a lot of people don't heed as much as they should. But what's interesting about this crisis is it, it is really a global epidemic. And it, it actually points to that the world has gotten more interconnected over the last several decades. Right? Mm. Now, on the other side that you spoke about in your book, you say, hey, get you a global broad index. And when he's talking about a global, you know, we here in America, we look at the global index as the SPY, you know, the S S&P 500. But when he's speaking about global, he's talking like about, your sport, you claim to be world champions, even if it's only American teams playing, it's almost like no one can solve <laughs> <them now. laughs> You know, America is oh, arrogant that way. Well, America is arrogant that way though, Lars, you know that. And you should know you represent about four, four percent of the global population, right? <laughs> So and, and that's why I wanted to bring you on to get that outside perspective for people yeah. to say that, hey, there's other economies out there outside of just America and S&P 500. Absolutely. No, absolutely. And but keep in mind, like if you look at most people, so I don't know much about your your viewers, but most people have tremendous exposure to their local economies right? through their job, through their education, through their house, to even if you lose your job, you're probably your next job is likely to be local. Your partner's job, your maybe your inheritance. If you look at all your assets, almost look at it holistically, and um, they're all very tied to your local economy, and by extension, your national economy. And so, the one thing you can do is, when you're buying your equities, you can put some of that elsewhere. Right? There was actually much more prevalent in the last financial crisis where you had pockets of complete disparity um, between how the various housing markets did. So there were people in was particularly Florida and, and Las Vegas that went horribly bust. And around the same time in two years, people in London did phenomenally well. Right? Mm -hmm. So those people in, in those local economies, if they had diversified away 
from the local economy with at least their equity, public equity investments, they would have fared better. They wouldn't have all their eggs in one basket. Mm. So when you say the S and P five hundred, of course it's a very very broadly and you know popular index. But why not go broader than that? Do you really have any reason to think that the U.S. markets will fare better or worse than the global markets over the next ten years? If you do, you're a genius. You're smarter than Warren Buffett. And and if you don't, at least accept the diversifying benefits. Mm. Okay. So for the people out there that are listening, that can say the people that can one thing. Okay. The S and P 500 is a unique index because it includes very, very large global companies. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you look at Facebook and Google and Apple, I think more than half their business is outside the U.S. despite them being U.S. businesses. So you indirectly get diversifying benefits. Mm -hmm. These are not local real estate businesses. These are large, large global companies. But it is true you're getting less diversification than you otherwise would. You're also getting diversification for from foreign exchange exposure, so, but that's another point for another time. Okay, now so people are saying, okay, so you, you he's speaking about the total bar, broad index. So people are saying S and P five hundred, Nasdaq, um, S and P five hundred, Nasdaq, and the Dow Jones. He's speaking that hey, go outside of your local economy, which is in the United States, and go get a total broad market index, something like Victor Tango, which is Vanguard's version of the total market index, right? Mm -hmm. Now, another thing you spoke about was you saying that, hey, when you're doing your equities, just get your total broad index, boom. And you spoke about another side was the bond side of the house. Why mm -hmm. adding bonds and what type of bonds you want to add to a portfolio? Yeah. So, so okay, so that gets slightly more complex, but I think what I'm trying to do is to say that you can, um, by the way, if we can just go back to the diversification just a tiny bit. When I'm on these uh, uh, media programs in my native Denmark, this is a more important point, right? Because the U.S. portion of the global stock markets is pretty high. So if you fail to diversify beyond the U.S., it's not that big a deal. You'd be better off for diversifying. Man, you're from Denmark, and the Danish stock market, which has actually done far better than the U.S. one, but... Whoa. Um, it's 1% of the global stock market, right? So if you only have that, you're really tied to the Danish economy and you really should diversify beyond it. You see what I mean? So it does depend a little bit on which market you're in. But the larger point on, on bonds, well, so, so we earlier we talked about how equity markets are very risky and that may not suit your personal risk profile. Now, your risk profile depends on a number of things that's dependent on you. How old are you? What's your job situation? How wealthy are you? What's your future wealth look like? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Even down to, you know, what's your risk tolerance? How do you feel about the prospect of losing money? Um, so let's say that for whatever reason, the heart, the heart, heart surgery example before where you needed $100 in a year and you had $105 now. Well, don't put in equities, right? You say put it in the bank. Well. You know, you know, banks go bust too, and also they don't give you a lot of interest. So for a U.S. person, um, government bonds are one of the least risky securities that you can get your hands on anywhere in the world because you're not taking foreign exchange risk and, you, you know, you have the credit of the U.S. government behind you. And so that's what I'm saying. Man, you can just buy two things in the world. One is this global diversified equity tracker. And the second is U.S. government bonds. And by the way, buy them of a maturity that roughly matches your time horizon. So if your time horizon is two years, buy two years. If it's five years, buy five-year government bonds. So what are you doing there is you have now two assets. And uh, one's very risky, named global equities, and the other is the closest you can come to a riskless asset, named U.S. government bonds. Um, and you can combine those two according to the risk profile that you want. And then you have created a very robust portfolio with just two securities. So that's pretty simple, right? So if you're very risk averse, maybe you have $90 out of 100 in the government bonds and $10 in equities. And if you're younger and more risk loving, maybe you have the opposite. I don't know, depends on who you are. And maybe go online, find some of the risk calculators. But the beauty of this portfolio is you haven't paid anyone to be clever for you. There's no one in a suit making a lot of money here. You're just mm -hmm. going to Vanguard and buying both of them wherever you think you can get it cheaply. And 
and you just let it sit there. And then you add to it when you can, and maybe you shift it around if your risk profile changes. Um, but that's all you have to do. So when I say you can sort of invest without sleepless nights, well, it's not that you're not going to lose money if markets go down. You're definitely going to lose money because you own the market. But you really can't do a lot about it. And because of that, you can, you can rest, <laughs> rest assured you're doing the right thing. Okay. So you're pretty much making it simple because I see a lot of people come in and they have a watch list of 20 stocks or 30 stocks of what they want to buy, take advantage of in a down economy. And you yeah. come in and just say, hey, look, if you got a total market index and you got bonds, if yeah. you match those to your risk levels, you can invest and get rid of speculation and have a sleepless night. Well, I mean, put it another way, someone, if I knew 20 stocks that was going to outperform the market, I'm not sure I'd go on your show and tell the world about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I probably charge someone a lot of money to say that. And, I, you know, I did used to run a hedge fund, so I guess that's what I used to do. But trust me, it's not easy. It's not easy to outperform the market. And there's also a huge selection bias. And the only people that go on your show are the people that have done it in the past. So you don't invite people to the show that haven't done it in the past. So that's perhaps half the people. So, you know, and then I add to that the people have a way of saying they have been. Add to that that we're inclined to believe we have been more successful in the past than we have been. So I'm just saying, look, at can you individually believe the guy that goes on the show, one guy versus another guy, one guy that goes, you go on any of the many, many TV channels and they all say something different, sometimes opposing views. Mm. You, know, you read the newspaper, they say a third thing, uh, other radio shows, a fourth thing, your advisor, a fifth thing. Are you really equipped to make those calls? Who's right, who's wrong? And if you are, well, good luck to you, but chances are statistically you're not. So what is it that you know that the rest of the world doesn't? The global equity markets is what, 70, 80 trillion dollars of really highly paid people spending a lot of money with access to the best information, best resources, best company, best technology, best everything. And you're saying you know better than all of them. It's actually staggering arrogance. Mm. Yeah, I do remember you said that about, can you kind of give people a glimpse into some of the access that hedge funds have resources to? When you spoke about you know, you get to go to these meetings and you get to meet with all the top executives, stuff like that, because a lot of a lot of us haven't been even exposed to that to even know that exists. Can you kind of tell the audience a little bit about what they are up against when they're going up against big hedge funds? Well, it's not just big hedge funds. It's anyone with a lot of money, right? You mm -hmm. see management, you see companies, you get the tours, you get all the best researchers in the world working for you, you get all the... <clears throat> You get all the best technology to look at stock price movements, liquidity. You get the first phone calls about information. <coughs> you get all the industry analysis. I mean, you have, you know, chances are you know some of them privately because you went to school with them or you studied with them or you built technology with them. And what's the real chance that someone sitting in boxer shorts in front of their computers is going to beat that? <laughs> you know, it's pretty slim. It's possible, but it's pretty slim. And if it is done, just make sure it wasn't luck, right? Mm. Okay. So <laughs> I don't have the virus, by the way. You know how to? You sure you got the coronavirus? I don't know. I, don't know. <laughs> I know a couple of people that have had it. It's kind of interesting. Uh, oh wow! So if you got questions for Mr. Lars Croger here, uh, live while he's on live, you can uh, bring up your questions, and I'll bring them up live. Um, I know Adam here says, "Welcome, sir." Uh, from Houston, and the the whole idea that you spoke about, he just spoke about. He just said, "Hey, you know, with a hedge fund, and they get to well, anybody with a large large sum of money, they get to pay for the top advice, the top research, the top everything." And he's saying, "What's the likelihood of someone sitting in front of their computer screen and boxer shorts that they can beat that?" And even with all that information, the all that insider information, you still say it's tough to out on the market. Not illegal information, but <laughs> well, say again? when you say inside information, the suggestion legal. that it's legal. legal, yeah, legal info. So even with all the information with the Broom, Bloomberg terminals, all that stuff like that, you still say it's hard to outperform the market. Yes. Wow. 
And well, it just, I mean, otherwise, they'd all be doing it, right? Yeah, that's true. So think of all these active managers. By the way, when you say active managers, what do you mean by that term is someone who's actively selecting and deselecting securities. So someone who buys Facebook but not Google or vice versa. And what I'm saying is after fees and expenses, that group, um, only about one to one and a half out of 10 of them outperform the market um, over a 10-year period. Right? So, I mean, those are the best informed, best educated, best access to everything investors you're going to find. And because of all the fees and expenses and the compounding of all that, they tend to not outperform. Wow. Do you think it's maybe the fee structure needs to change? Maybe lower fees? Like we live in a low fee to almost no fee society now. You know, E-Trade is free and TD Ameritrade is free. You know, By the way, you be aware of free, right? It's not free. They find a way to charge you. Oh, yeah. They, I would <laughs> say change it around because <laughs> they yeah. got to be in business some type of way. How they, yeah. um, I would say changes yeah. in the fee, the fee structure, right? Yeah. Hopefully, so you, lower, yeah. So do you say it need to be a change in the fee structure? It's come down a lot. It's come down a lot. I mean, you, people used to pay a lot for essentially index type exposure. That's changed. Um, so that's gotten better. And I mean, there's room for it to get better still, but yeah. So even in the hedge fund business, is that even a business to even go to or whatnot? Or what do you say about the future? Uh, it's a fascinating business. Absolutely. If you can do it and do it well, First of all, you make you very, very wealthy, but perhaps more interestingly, it's it's like, um, I mean, well, it was like the bad. It was you have an a, ability in the hedge funds to create the exact kind of exposure you want to create. You know, take luck out of the equation. I always thought that if you make an investment in a stock, just any old stock, you you know, so big a part of your returns is going to be dependent on the future of the economy and the markets in general, which you don't necessarily know. But if you buy one stock at the same time, sell another stock, you're creating a different kind of exposure. And you can get quite nuanced about that and create an exposure that you think reflects exactly some sort of an insight that you have. And that may not be market correlated. It may, it sometimes is. Um, but that's interesting. It's interesting work. And if you can do it well, it's absolutely fascinating. You get to work with really, really interesting and smart people. They're not all these Ferrari driving, cigar smoking morons that you see in the movies. A lot of them are really, really fascinating and uh, people that are deeply interested in the world around them. Okay. So we have one question here. Max B says, uh, that bonds are, do you think bonds are still good even with the low yields? That's a tough question. I, I mean, I, I don't really have a strong view. It sounds absurd given my background, but I don't really have a strong view on a lot of these asset classes. I think what you should start with is say, you know, obviously it's, it's, it kind of sucks to not get a lot of interest from owning bonds, but that's, that's the world we live in. Mm. And, and can they go, you know, at some point bond yields can't go a lot lower because people would start hoarding cash <laughs> but um but at the same time i think you should almost think of it more in the context of your overall portfolio what does a bond exposure do to your risk your overall risk um and and accept that if you want something very very low risk you're not going to get a paid a lot for it you're actually getting paid a historically very low amount for it but but that's that's the world we live in. Think of it as more like the risk calibrator. And here I'm talking these these U.S. government bonds. Of course, you can get any risk profile you want in the corporate bond market, including some very high risk ones. But if we're just talking about these government bond risks, well, if you want a lot of return, you, you you're going to have to accept some risk for that, and you should think about how that fits into your life rather than sort of speculating on the movement in bond prices. Okay. Well, Typically, in these kind of crises, it's an escape mm -hmm. asset, right? It's where people put money they don't want to lose. And I had a question for you. Could you tell the audience out there, you know, your hedge fund days, how large did you grow your hedge fund as far as assets and the management? We had about a billion, billion dollars. How much? 
A billion dollars? A billion dollars. Lars, could I borrow five dollars? <laughs> <laughs> so now with that being said, with that large amount of money, right? And all across the different asset classes. This is a long this is a long time ago, right? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> 2008 when you kind of you know i know you, you were yeah, I was very very lucky i stopped right before the crash <laughs> so you started right before the crash and you got out right before the 2008 crash i mean you got out right before the 2008 crash correct yeah well i'm still involved in these um investing in funds and in uh in uh I sit on their boards which is i really enjoy and some of them have done far better than me so that's <laughs> good for them wow okay we got another question here that says, hello, do you expect small cap companies to outperform large cap companies in general as the U.S. markets come out of the correction territory? Um, if the market does well, then I would expect that to be true. Traditionally, smaller cap companies have um, a higher gearing to general good performance than Large cap companies. It's not always true, but tradition is. It's. I think it used to be called the small cap bias. So essentially, think of it this way: that if the S and P five hundred goes up ten percent, small caps tend to go up, call it fifteen percent. Mm. But this T story has been the case. Now, of course, of course, the adverse is also true, right? That if the big companies go down a lot, the small caps go down a lot more. Okay. But again. So be careful about these rules of thumb because every time it's different. Right? Okay. All right. So you're pretty much saying that, hey, when the, in the rule of thumb is anything, I guess, which is not very helpful. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's like, you say something, he's like, uh, well, you got to be careful with that because that could change. But, yeah, so but I, it's also true, right? It's, in, you know, if it was always that predictable, the market would price it in. Hmm. But I do think it is some truth. It's a bit like emerging markets has historically done better in good markets and worse in bad markets. But actually, the last five years have been an exception to that rule. But well, that's sort of a rule of thumb, generally. Okay. But again, with caveats. Right? Now, the question is, how do hedge funds grow to become that big? Like, you know, these billion dollars of assets. And how do they grow to become that big? Uh, they, they take investors. They, I mean, some of the big funds are fifty billion dollar hedge funds, mm -hmm. I know. And, and basically, it's that simple, right? You get institutional investors that invest hundreds of million dollars at a time, and you get enough of those, and very, very quickly, you're running a lot of money, and you do it for years and years, and you perform really well for them, and yeah, you can get staggering amounts of assets through the door. Wow. But what are these people at? I don't ever see these institutions. Because <laughs> huh? I, I see it happen all the time. You know, I, I know. Uh, I'm not, are right in those buildings behind you. They're right, right in the buildings behind me? Right, absolutely. I just got to go talk to them. All right. But find, find the right floor in that landscape uh, behind you. And you will. <laughs> no, absolutely. You're kidding me. I mean, the big endowments, the insurance companies, the pension funds, the ultra high net worth individuals. And that's just now we're just starting the US that go abroad. It's wow. staggering well. Wow. Okay. So do you ever see yourself coming back to the hedge fund business or are you just done with it completely? I think I'm done. I'm, I enjoy being on these boards. It's it's I enjoy that actually. It's nice. Okay. It's a nice way to stay involved, but I haven't had a day yet where I was sort of dying to go analyze a bunch of stocks or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but some people love it. I think it's one of my mistakes, frankly. There are people that love it more than I do. Uh, now, there are people, when it's Saturday, they wish it was Monday so they could go uh, analyze stocks. Right? No, wow. I do them. So. Now, to a new person, right? Well, when, even back in your day, last decade, do you want to give any tips on how do you analyze stocks? Oh, I think that's that. That's a longer conversation. I would, mm. I would certainly say anyone that thinks they can teach it to you in a short amount of time is full of shit. So, mm. 
study hard, study long, learn from really good people, and don't ever think it's easy. Um, and I know that's not saying a lot, but these like learn to pick stocks in 15 minutes or buy a book and I'll teach you how to beat the market. Uh, no, don't do it. Don't, well, and certainly don't give money to anyone like that. Right? Mm. Because that's, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I tell you, there's a, a friend's tennis coach approached me recently and was offered some amazing opportunity to, you know, 20% return every, I think it was yearly, and asked me if he should do it. And, and I was sort of like, what, what do you think of the chances that they need your money if they have something that can provide that outstanding returns? Mm-hmm. That they need to go find the tennis coach who can give them maybe $500 or $1,000. It's staggering unlikely to be the case, but I don't know the first thing about it. It just seemed too good to be true. And it probably was, I don't know. You know so just be aware of those things. It's, you know, it's very rare that, that, that I think you have, I mean, I mean even for me, and, and keep in mind, I'm like a, you know, I'm, I'm an actual like angel investor and stuff. I always, the first question is like, why do they need my money? <laughs> you're so bloody good you know, in, in your own industry why don't you have your sort of people falling all over you so just don't do that and that's another thing about all this like investing in the broad symbol market exposure is you're probably not going to get ripped off and that alone is worth a fair bit okay well Al comments he said I love this guy's honesty <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. that's very kind appreciate that but look, it's one of the problems, to be honest, is I don't, I don't make any money from saying this. I mean, my books sell some, but I give that to charity, and it's not a lot anyhow. So that's one of the problems that all these people that put up the ads or send stuff in the post or whatever they all do these days, they all got to get paid. Even the financial news programs, they all got to get paid. And they get paid by the advertisers, and the advertisers are trying to sell you shit, right? So there's very few people with the best, even you, May. Mm-hmm. The reason you couldn't have me on every week, because I'd say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> You'd soon run out of yours. And so the problem with it is it's, you have tremendous vested interest in having people do something super active and expensive. Very few people are interested in telling people to do something pretty boring that doesn't pay a lot of fees. And you certainly don't get invited to the football. <laughs> you know, so and that's sort of what I'm saying. And I'm, I don't know. It, it's a, I mean, it's a pretty unrewarding thing to say. I assure you that. Okay. Now, Max B has a question from Louisiana. He said, "How could you become a hedge manager, hedge fund manager?" Um, well, essentially, um, so I give an annoying answer to that. I do actually have to run in a minute, but. Um, um, uh, what is a hedge fund manager really, right? It's just someone who's managing a pool of capital, okay? There's some, you have to be approved by the, the, the relevant authorities, and there's a problem. I think it's the, in the U.S. it's the SEC, and there's a process. Mm-hmm. And then essentially all a hedge fund is is a pool of capital that you put in a fund. Think of it as you know, a legal minimum, um, of um, money that you can take and there's some specific regulations around hedge funds so in other words you can't just approach people on the street they have to be I think the term is sophisticated investors or high net worth individuals but assuming you know enough of them and you can convince them to invest with them you can anyone can create a hedge fund you need to be regulated and you need to pass the rest of the relevant exams um, and 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 then you need to do well for a, a while, and once you do well for a while, more people will give you money. Right? It's, it, it's, the, the concept is pretty simple, right? That you get manage people's money, you do well with it, and you do well for a while, and more people will give you money. And um, what's hard is to actually perform well. That's the magic. Right? I mean, if you are the next Warren Buffett, people will probably eventually find you. Mm. Okay. Well, Lars, I know you got to get running. I want to say uh, thanks for coming by. Thanks for being a uh, my mentor out there in the UK. And one of these days, I want to make it out there. 
good luck and uh, and good luck with this virus. And I'll tell you, we we all hear about you guys are not taking it seriously, though. So you got to take it pretty serious. It's a big deal. Yeah. It's the first time America has seen something like this. This why. Um, I think the world has seen something like this, but I just the thing people don't get in this is the power of exponential curves. I they go incredibly quickly. And if you see the number of deaths rise at this exponential curve, you it'll it's going to be horrifying. And the US is still so early days in this that it's still not enough deaths um wow. to to have the US take it seriously enough. And also there's been very very few tests done in the US relative to the rest of the world. And it's if you really really and once you see these deaths rack up a lot, and then you take it really serious, you, you're about 14 days too late. Wow. So, anyhow, so I will say that, but it's not part of this conversation. I don't have any special insight into that. So Okay. Just want to let you know, some, uh, Al said earlier today he brought the uh, Swab Total Market Index Fund. He will be doing more research so he can invest into the global index. He <laughs> says, thank you for all the information. Um, Marley says, thank you greatly. No, and thank you. We have another one that says, thank you, Prince and Lars. All right, thank Lars, you. is there anything that you want to leave the live audience and the people that catch the playback? Uh, how can they follow you? How can they grab your books? I know you, he yeah, he wrote a book called, um, what it was, the, the Truths of a Hedge Fund Manager? Or the Untold Truth, something like that? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Confessions um, of a Hedge Fund I have a, I have videos up on YouTube if you're interested. And, um, mm -hmm. They're pretty well viewed and just trying to keep this sort of message simple and keep it out there. There's also some stuff on how to build financial spreadsheets and stuff. So, um, And mm -hmm. of course, you can buy my books. If you, if you can spell my surname, you can find my books. <laughs> 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 That's normally the challenge. Um, okay. But thanks very much for having me on, mate. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Lars. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, this is the Investor Show. Until the next video, podcast, cartoon, or whatever else you see me do crazy around the globe, peace, be safe. I'm out, and thank you.